this week on the Back Table Podcast. I think the biggest thing about chronic cough that we don't necessarily realize or don't always appreciate is that chronic cough is a multidisciplinary problem. It can impact, like I said at the beginning, it can impact any any of the six major body systems, essentially, right? So we can't treat it in a vacuum. It requires interacting with our colleagues in pulmonary, our colleagues in GI, our, and speech pathology, of course. So it's it's a difficult problem and it impacts a lot of people it, and it impacts quality of life significantly. And so I think it's worth, you know, spending some significant time with those patients and working with our colleagues to try and find them some answers and some relief. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. Cook Medical's otolaryngology head and neck surgery clinical specialty strives to provide otolaryngologists with minimally invasive solutions to address unmet needs. Areas of focus include head and neck, otology, and laryngology, with products ranging from a full suite of interventional silendoscopy products and the Doppler blood flow monitoring system to the BioDesign otologic repair graft and the Hercules 100 transnasal esophageal balloon. For more information, visit cookmedical.com forward slash otolaryngology. Now back to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast. My name is Gopi Shaw, and I'm a pediatric ENT. Today, I have a very special guest from Shreveport, Louisiana. I have Dr. Karuna Dewan. She was born and raised in Kalamazoo, Michigan. She attended college and medical school in Chicago at Northwestern University as part of the honors program in medical education. During her residency in otolaryngology, Dr. Dewan trained in both Houston and Memphis, and she completed a laryngology fellowship at UCLA under Dr. Gerald Burke and Dr. Janesh Chetri. Karina has a special interest in the treatment of chronic cough, and that's what we're going to talk about today. She is currently an assistant professor in otolaryngology at Louisiana State University in Shreveport, my hometown, and she's here again today to talk to us about chronic cough in adults. Welcome to the show, Karina. How are you? Good. Hi, Gopi. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. And of course, tell us about some of your experience with broadcasting and radio and TV. (laughs) Sure. So like you said, I'm an academic laryngologist. I've been doing this for a few years now. I see both adults and children. I got into laryngology because I had a background in broadcasting. and I was always interested in the voice, why we like some voices better than others, why voices sound different. And sort of through school and my experiences, I became also very interested in quality of life. And so now my practice tends to be a little bit more dysphagia and swallowing heavy rather than voice. But I do all three. I have a comprehensive laryngology practice. So I do airway, voice and swallowing. And cough is kind of central to all three of those things, interestingly enough. And cough is one of these sort of diagnostic enigmas. It can be anything and everything. So I think that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, in the pediatric world, chronic cough is also, it's hard to tease out and figure out sort of what's going on. And I think it's one of the harder things, just like dysphagia and some of the, all of those quality of life. Um, Things are very difficult. So let's just first talk in terms of what makes it chronic. Like, is there a certain time period? Yeah. So cough that's persistent longer than two months is by definition chronic cough. So we're seeing a lot of people who had COVID or had a URI, like a upper respiratory tract infection or sign of cold flu type thing, and they're still coughing. And for up to two months, up to eight weeks, that can still be the remnants of that initial infection. But after it's been two months, then we start to think that this has become a chronic condition. Chronic cough is pervasive. It's expensive. There are estimates that somewhere between 9 and 30% of the population suffer from chronic cough. It's the single most common reason adults go to see the primary. And it becomes even more interesting because we know that cough has a function too. Cough has a basic function. So you don't want to completely prevent cough because it has a positive effect also. It keeps the pulmonary alveoli open It's used to expel things. So if you're eating or drinking and something goes down the wrong way, you have to cough to get it up. Cough can be voluntary. We all cough, clear our throat very often. And then cough is a response to stimulation in the larynx. 
in the throat and in the lower respiratory tract. So stimulation, which can be foreign particles, can be an allergen, can be pretty much anything. We need to do what we often as physicians call pulmonary toilet is to get that stuff out of our lungs. So entirely preventing cough is not the goal, but really making it so that people can live a comfortable life in concert with the cough. Yeah. You said chronic cough. Is it about once it's persistent after eight weeks? When do you usually see patients in your clinic? What's the range? Yeah, it's definitely a range. I have always practiced at a tertiary care center. So I see people after they've seen a lot of other doctors and they, you know, I'm usually opinion number eight, nine or 10. So people are sort of at their end. I have patients who say, you know, I've been coughing since 1972. And I have patients who, one of my partners who got COVID and has been coughing for the last three months. So it's a wide range, but really people tend to come in when it is bothering them when it's hindering their life. So prior to COVID, we would see people who would come in and say, you know, I can't go to the ballet. I can't go to a movie because it's disrupting to those around me. And now we're seeing people that they don't want to go grocery shopping. They don't want to have dinner with their family. They don't want to socialize because everyone keeps asking, are you sick? And so it's become sort of a more of a social problem, really. And so when these patients come to you, what kind of questions do you usually ask them? Like, what are you looking for in your history? What is something that helps you kind of tease out etiology, treatments, risk factors? In the diagnosis of chronic cough, the history, the HPI is really important. I start with what makes you cough? Can you identify triggers? It's kind of 50-50. Some patients will know exactly what makes them cough. Some patients will not know at all. But Are there certain smells? Does exercise make you cough? Do you cough when you eat or drink? Or do you cough after you eat or drink? Is it change in temperature? A lot of people will say, oh, when the air conditioning hits me, I'll cough. When I sit in front of a fan, I'll cough. Is coughing triggered by talking or by laughing? Does something make your cough stop? One of the key things that I like to ask is, do you wake up in the middle of the night coughing? Do you feel short of breath? Do you feel like your voice has changed? For those people who cough when they eat or drink, do you feel like you also have difficulty swallowing? Are there some foods that you avoid because you think they're going to trigger a cough? Do you have seasonal allergies? Do you have allergies to pets? Have you seen an allergist? And then, of course, you know, what treatments have you tried? What has worked for you? I like to ask people, when did your cough start? Do you remember being sick when your cough started? It's very common to hear, you know, I had this cold, flu, something, and my co- everything else got better, but my cough never got better. Do you smoke? Does someone in your home smoke? And then, you know, I ask them all these questions and I usually ask them about their medication list and then I will look at their medication list pretty carefully. Before we get to medication list, um, in terms of some of the questions, so during eating makes me think of aspiration, after eating makes me think of GERD, waking up in the middle of the night, what am I, what am I thinking of? Reflex. Reflex. So patients okay. wake up in the middle of the night. It's, you know, they've eaten a big meal. They've eaten something fatty, greasy. They've been drinking alcohol and then they go out there, they lie down. And so it's the midnight reflux, the nocturnal reflux that I'm looking for with that. Allergies, I'm thinking post nasal drainage. What about like smells and temperature, exercise? What are, what are we thinking there? So exercises can point, it can point to asthma. It can also point to like subglottic stenosis paradoxical vocal fold motion. And really what I'm looking for in the smells, the change in temperature is the irritable larynx picture. It's like a post-viral sensory neuropathy, essentially. And we'll we'll talk more about that in depth. But those, and the, the talking and laughing also, the people who they talk for a while or they start laughing, they're laughing really hard and then it turns into a cough or uh, certain smells or cold. A lot of time, it's very often cold. And that's also part of that irritable Mm, larynx. Irritable larynx. All right. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, we'll get there. So in terms of medications, we think of the ACE inhibitors. Are there other medications or alternative medications, vitamins and things like that as well on your medication list? So ACE inhibitors are a big red flag. And then what's interesting is there's some cross-reactivity with the ARBs. So we tell people, you know, if you're on an ACE inhibitor and you're coughing to try an ARB, but there are a certain percentage of ARBs and certain patients who will also have a cough with an ARB. So I'm admittedly not that good at internal medicine. So I will refer people back to their PCP. I will write the PCP a letter and say, you know, I've exhausted all other avenues. I think this is where the cough is coming from. Can you help me modify their medications? But I will like people to not be on an ACE and not be on an ARB. Okay, that's good to know too. Because also, are they able to even come off of it? 
And then tell me in terms of before we get to physical exam, since COVID, do you ask them like, have you had COVID? When was your last COVID infection? Are there certain things you're looking for now in the post-COVID world specific to chronic cough? I'm seeing a lot more post-viral cough. And then the other thing that we're seeing, even interestingly, even in patients who were not necessarily intubated, I'm seeing a lot more granulation tissue in the airway, granulation tissue, subglottic narrowing, things like that. So I ask the patients who've had COVID and are coughing after COVID, I ask them a lot more questions about exercise tolerance, noisy breathing, waking up gasping for breath, things that would tell me that they maybe have an airway stenosis, maybe have granulation tissue in their subglottis. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. I apologize. And this is specific to having a COVID infection and being intubated at the time? Not necessarily. That's what's really interesting is there's a degree of vocal fold paresis and paralysis and some subglottic granulation tissue that people, even people who were not intubated are developing. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. And it's, it's been reported by a couple of different groups. I think the group at NYU reported it. I can't remember. There's two other people, other groups that have reported it, but we're definitely seeing that. And so in terms of like the post-COVID cough and airway complications, is this kind of like anosmia where, but a lot of times the anosmia gets better, the cough gets better and you just see it maybe three to six months. Are these patients like your long haulers where we still have a concern with this like months later, years later? Have we been able to tease some of that out or what have you seen? Yeah, I'm not really sure. The patients that I see are people who tend to have been coughing for a while for several months already. And um, I do have a small cohort of patients that are long COVID, the, the long haulers, and they have a lot of other symptoms too. I think, you know, the post-viral sensory neuropathy, these are essentially, these are patients that have post-viral reaction essentially. So the superior laryngeal nerve is involved. And I think it's the same pathophysiology as when we used to see people with a viral bronchitis who had a cough that lasted a long time. But because they're also deconditioned in other ways, they have poor pulmonary function because of the COVID infection. A lot of times they'll have other neuropathies because of COVID. So it just kind of compounds their whole experience. Wow. Okay. And on your initial like HPA or when you see these patients, are there certain questionnaires that you use for chronic cough? I do. I use the cough severity index, the CSI and... Actually, I give my patients six surveys. It's a lot of surveys, but depending on what you're there for. So everybody fills out the EAT-10, the VHI-10, the reflux symptom index. There's the dysphonia index, the CSI, which is a cough severity index, and then the VCI, the voice catastrophe index. Ah, uh, okay. There's, there's six of them. And that's, you know, we track patients over time and then we can compare groups to each other. But it's really interesting to see the people who use their voice a lot are people who tend to say the cough is really impacting my life. People who have a public facing, forward facing job, they say the cough is really impacting my life. So a lot of this is quality of life. How is it impacting you on your day to day basis? And then I bet some of these surveys also help tease out symptoms and differential and what you're leaning towards too. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So in terms of physical exam, tell me what your exam's like in clinic. I like to tell the residents your exam begins the moment you walk in the room. So when I walk in the room, I'm looking at this patient and I'm looking to see, are they on supplemental oxygen? Did they seem short of breath when they're talking to me? Did they seem short of breath when they were walking down the hallway towards the room? Does their voice sound wet? Do they cough while I'm taking the history? Because that's telling. Sometimes they'll say, this cough is really killing me. I coughs all the time, but I talk to them for 20 minutes and they don't cough. What is their body habit? Is Are they thin? Are they obese? Are they sitting up straight or are they tripoding and hunched over? Do they have edema of their hands or feet that I can see? So I do a comprehensive head and neck exam, essentially. Start at the top and look at their eyes, look in their ears, look in their nose. Um, I'm looking in their nose to look for rhinorrhea, signs of allergies. I, look, I do a complete oral cavity and oral pharyngeal exam masses, lesions, ulcers, things like that. But I listen to the heart and lungs, which I think is a lot of things that, you know, most ENTs don't do, but I'm listening to their heart and lungs because people can cough when they have fluid overload. People can cough when they have asthma, when they have pulmonary fibrosis. So I'm listening to hear, you know, for other sources. And then everybody gets scope exam and that's part of coming to see a laryngologist is I'm going to look at your larynx. <laughs> Um, I think it's really important that if somebody's been coughing for two months that they get a laryngeal exam because too often we miss things that are, you know, we miss cancer. So it's really important to look. I like cough and I think it's interesting. And I, I show all my residents and even a lot of the patients this diagram. It has 
sort of cough at the top and it has six systems listed. So your cough can be cardiac in origin. So patients can have CHF and you can tell that by looking at them, by looking at their hands or feet. Are they puffy? Do they have pitting edema? It can be pulmonary in origin. And that's part of why I listen to everybody's chest. I ask them about their smoking history. I ask them about their medications. It can be gastrointestinal in nature. So As we know, branches of the vagus supply the esophagus, the pharynx. And so really irritation anywhere between your teeth and your stomach can cause somebody to cough. So you really um, owe it to the patient to examine the area. Cough can be nasal sinus allergy in origin. Cough can be laryngeal. And I think that's why it's important to image the larynx. And then lastly, kind of when we've eliminated everything else, cough can be neurogenic. And that's what we've sort of alluded to a little bit and we'll get into a little bit more. No, thank you for going through that system-wise because that kind of helps you think of the differential, right? Right. That's how I like to organize it so that I know I'm not missing something. I kind of go in order. And we've created a worksheet for the patients because when patients come to me, they've seen a smattering of people. Some come from pulmonology, some come from GI, some come from allergy. And so we created this worksheet for the patients where they can fill out the date on which they had what test. And if they have the results, they can fill out the results so that when they come to me, I sort of act like almost like a secretary where I'm collating all this information from all the different specialists so we can try and figure out what's left, what stone has been unturned. And in terms of your scope exam, are you doing just flexible laryngoscopy or is it traditionally strobes every time? I guess two questions. One is, which one do you use? What are your preference? And two, what are you looking for on your scope exam? So I start with a plain light exam, with a plain flexible exam. When I look with the flexible exam or just a plain light, I'm looking for basic things, masses, lesions, leukoplakia, ulcers, anything. You know, I had one of my favorite cough patients actually had a mass in his base of tongue. It ended up being, it was a lipoma, but he was coughing because when he would eat, food was getting stuck on this mass. And then he kept clearing his throat and coughing to try and get it to move. And so you're essentially looking for, you're trying to think, you know, what structural lesions, what structural problems are going to cause somebody to cough. So once I've done the flexible, just a plain light flexible, then I move on to the strobe. Strobe best shows us motion. When I use the strobe, I'm looking for asymmetry, asymmetry between left and right, because Globus, which is related, you know, it's all kind of on a spectrum, globus, feeling like something's stuck in your throat and coughing because you feel like something's stuck in your throat. Globus is 50% of the time caused by an asymmetry between left and right. We feel the difference between left and right. So it feels like there's something stuck in our throat. And so people keep going, trying to clear their throat and get rid of whatever's in there. So I'm looking for an asymmetry. Does one side move less than the other? Is there a paresis? Is there a paralysis? Is there a small lesion that you can't necessarily see with white light, but it's impacting how the vocal folds vibrate? It's impacting the mucosal wave, things like that. And then the third part of my scope exam is a fees. So it was an endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. So every patient, I do sort of a basic screening fees. Every patient that comes to see me, unless they have an overt airway only problem, everyone's getting a fees. And the purpose of that is to see a lot of times people cannot, we're not able to accurately report is something getting stuck in our throat. So we start with applesauce, which is a pureed consistency. It's the easiest consistency to form a bolus and swallow. So we start with that. Everything has green food coloring in it so we can see it on the video. So we do applesauce then we do a sip of water with a straw. When you drink with a straw, it comes out faster than drinking with a cup. So you kind of see people's reaction time if they're able to control. And then we do a cookie, a Lorna Dune cookie to see how their teeth work. Do you have teeth? Do your dentures fit? Do your teeth come together appropriately? Can you chew a bolus? Does your tongue work well enough to push the bolus where it needs to go? And then do we see, you know, does your palate elevate? Do we see a whiteout? And then does the UES open appropriately and food enter the UES or does it fall down into the airway? Is it getting stuck, the base of tongue, a paralaryngeal, you know, things like that. So any sort of impairment in swallowing is going to cause people to cough and clear their throat as well. So that's why the fees is really important. Now, not every patient, but some patients will also get transnasal esophagoscopy or a TNE. And that's kind of what I alluded to when I mentioned sort of the gastrointestinal branch of this chronic cough differential is that I feel it's very, and most laryngologists would probably agree that it's important to look in the esophagus. We have a lot of patients out there who've been on PPIs forever and ever. 
but no one's ever looked in their esophagus. So it's really important. I stress this to the patients that if you have been on a PPI for a year, someone should look in your esophagus. But things that can cause coughs that happen in the esophagus that we can easily see, we see signs of reflux. We can see Barrett's esophagus. You can tell if somebody has a cricopharyngeal achalasia or a narrowing at the UES or a stricture, esophageal dysmotility. So the way I do my exam is that I've done the fees. It takes me five minutes to then set up my esophagoscope. So if in that time I still see leftover green food from the fees in their esophagus, then I know there's a motility issue. Eosinophilic esophagitis, I think, is in the adult population underdiagnosed. And there are a lot of theories about that. It's the same in peds. I mean, it's, I think, getting better understood. And, you know, it's multidisciplinary at certain centers, but you have to look for and understand it to know to look for it kind of too. You know, if you see a sort of middle-aged, like 40-ish year old Caucasian male who has throat clearing, coughing, and sometimes some feeling of food getting stuck, that's sort of the first thing that I think of is, does he have undiagnosed eosinophilic esophagitis? Fungal infection of the esophagus, so candida, Zenker's diverticulum in someone, and this goes back to, you know, all those HPI questions. Do you cough when you're lying down? When you cough, does food come back up? Do you, you know, patient who coughs, but do you also have bad breath? So these are things that would lead me to think that somebody has a Zenker's. And then this is also a very interesting one, is people who have a history of gastric bypass or the Lynx procedure. The vagus nerve can be irritated by the links, by the magnets in the links procedure or by a gastric bypass. And so these people will oftentimes have a neurogenic cough that's caused by mechanical irritation to the vagus nerve. Wow. So that's one other reason to kind of know their whole history and then look in the esophagus. So that's kind of my exam. They're based on what I find. There are sort of a few things that I will refer people for. I refer people for manometry for pH testing, and then also modified barium swallow or esophagram. So before we go to the testing, I wanted to ask you, is your speech pathologist here with you on these initial evaluations? Mm -hmm. So they're with you during the scopes for the larynx and the esophagus? Yes. And the initial eval? So the way we work here is a team model. So all new patients are evaluated by both speech and by myself. And I find that Those patients who need therapy, whether it's speech therapy, swallow therapy, respiratory retraining therapy, cough suppression therapy, the speech therapists have a lot to offer the laryngology practice and the cough patient. Those patients who need therapy, there's better buy-in and there's literature out there in the SLP literature as well as within the ENT literature that says when patients meet the SLP at their initial evaluation, they're more likely to participate in their therapy, to make those follow-up appointments. It means more when they meet that person, they actually meet a human being and they shake their hand and they tell them, this is what I have to offer you. Then the physician saying, well, I'd like you to see my friend who's a therapist. They're going to do some things for you. So I feel very strongly that the speech therapist should be actively involved in clinic. The way my clinic's set up and sort of the goal (laughs) is that all new patients are seen by both of us together. And oftentimes what I do is I will have the speech therapist go in and do the history. They know the questions that I'm asking. They know what I'm looking for, but they also have their own questions too. So the speech therapist will often do the history and laryngologists do things different ways. I personally like to do the scope exam. I have residents who will also do the scope exam because we are at a teaching institution, but I feel that there is a tactile feedback from doing the exam yourself. So um, I do most of the scope exams myself or I guide a resident through it. But the speech pathologist is in the room and we go over the strobe exam and the fees together. Oftentimes when we're doing the fees, I will scope and the speech pathologist will feed the patient. And we go over those results in real time together also with the patient so that that also increases buy-in, more likelihood that they will participate in the therapy and sort of understanding of what's going on. We look at a lot of pictures. We show the patient their own video and we also show them kind of what does normal look like so they can get an understanding of what's not right and what needs to be fixed and things like that. That's great. In the Pete's world, again, I feel like we would not know what to do with pediatric dysphagia voice, anything without, you know, feeding from birth on our speech pathologists play such an important role in terms of diagnosis, workup, as well as management. I mean, absolutely. I do a little bit of Pete's and some of the things, the feeding questions that come up are just really very interesting. The failure to thrive baby, because you can't, you can ask mom questions, but it's not the same as asking the patient themselves, right? But 
the baby's not going to tell you. <laughs> so it's very, and I think the speech pathologist has a lot to add to that exam and the differential as well. So that's, I really enjoy working very closely with my speech pathologist. All right. So in terms of testing, and I think that we're better overall as ENTs, whether it comes to hearing loss, to cough, to kind of getting targeted testing. Tell us about the testing, what's out there and how you decide what you're going to get in terms of the role of a chest x-ray versus a CT chest to does this patient need a video swallow now that I've had my eating 10 and my T&E or, you know, my fees like spirometry. Are you getting that? Is that something that you talk to Palm about? So it kind of, it depends where on the differential we're looking. So my workhorse, and like I said, about half of my practice is dysphagia. My workhorse tends to be a modified barium swallow. The modified barium swallow is done by a speech pathologist in radiology, and it's a dynamic study. So patients get a variety of bolus sizes and bolus consistencies, and they're administered by the speech pathologist. And the nice thing about the modified barium swallow is they can also do treatment and like exercises and things. So they can practice things like the chin tuck head turn for somebody with a unilateral paralysis and see on fluoroscopy, does it help? Does it change the direction of bolus? I order a modified barium swallow for those patients who I think they may have an esophageal problem, essentially. I think they may have a narrowing at their UES. I think they may have a chalasia. I'm basically looking to see how does food move from the oropharynx into the esophagus and down the esophagus. I will order an esophagram, which is different, which is one consistency. It's just chugging essentially barium. I will order that for somebody who I think may have a Zanker's diverticulum. When I want to see maximum distension of the esophagus or the PE segment, that's when I'll order an esophagram. I order things, and I I will definitely refer to pulmonology, but I order pulmonary function testing in those patients that I think may have subglottic stenosis, may have PVFM. But a lot of times it's COVID patients, patients who've previously had COVID, they're waking up coughing, they feel short of breath. I want to know what their underlying lung status is too. So for those patients, I will order pulmonary function testing. And I don't do that terribly often because a lot of times patients have come to me from pulmonology. So I will order a chest x-ray actually fairly often. And the chest x-ray is for a patient in the office that I've done a fees for. And I can tell that they look like they're aspirating fairly often, but they, they say that they haven't been sick. They haven't had any pneumonias. And they're also the patient who just, you tell them, hey, let's thicken your liquids or let's talk about maybe not drinking thin liquids or let's talk about doing some maneuvers. And they're just kind of, they don't really want to participate. They're like, I'm doing fine. So I like to get a chest x-ray so that we have something to talk about. Maybe they are doing fine. You know, there are plenty of people who are functional aspirators out there, but maybe they also have an undiagnosed pneumonia. So I will, and then we have an x-ray to talk about, to show them and say, look, there's stuff in your lungs. I'm worried about what's going to happen to you. I don't want you to get sick. Let's change your diet. I'm very fortunate in our Voice and Swallow Center here that we also have a dietitian who works with us very closely. So when it comes to modifying diets and suggesting alternative things for people, we have a very facile dietitian who's really helpful. That's amazing. What about pH pro manometry? Is that where you get your GI colleagues involved or do you do some of that on your own? Or I really want to actually learn how to do pharyngeal manometry and manometry, but there's just, there's only so many hours in the day, which is really unfortunate. <laughs> you mean being a UCLA fellowship train laryngologist isn't enough? I have several colleagues that I'm good friends with who do their own manometry and it, it looks really cool and I mess around with the equipment and I want to learn to do it, but I just don't. There's just no more hours. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we have partners. That's why we have multidisciplinary. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right, right. That's why we have subspecialties within Odo and yes. the niches in those subspecialties. Well, I love working with GI. So one of the best experiences that I have had is a multidisciplinary complex dysphagia clinic where patients would see... So it would be a day experience for the patient, but they would see speech pathology and get their modified barium swallow in the morning. And in the afternoon, they would have a group visit with myself, GI, and speech pathology. And we would do a fees and a T&E all together in the same room. And so patients, it's sort of a one-stop shop for these patients that we know have a complex history, a complex dysphagia history. So I love working with GI. I think we have a lot to share. And Interestingly enough, most gastroenterologists, I, I say this because my dad is gastroenterologist and this is how I ended up in this field. Most gastroenterologists don't think about the upper esophageal sphincter. They think all the dysphagia starts below it. 
And they, they also think that all ENTs think everything is reflux, which we don't. Not true. This is an ongoing debate. Like, how can you tell you skim from a scope that if there's reflux? I'm like, well, it's red, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's swollen. So, so I, I'm fortunate to have a nurse practitioner in my department who does pH pro. She will do the res tech for me. And so a lot of my patients will get, I will empirically treat people for reflux for three months. If they don't get better in three months, then I'm sending them for a pH probe. I want to see kind of what their reflux looks like, what the numbers look like, when are they refluxing so that we can modify kind of when they take their medicine. And that's the point at which I would refer to GI. I think manometry is a great tool. Like I explained to the patients, your esophagus is supposed to squeeze like a snake swallows, like from top to bottom. And if it's not doing that in a timely and organized manner, things are going to get stuck and it's going to feel uncomfortable. And so the only way that we find out about that is if we do a manometry. And so I order manometry for those patients who complain of like mid chest discomfort, or I feel like I have to cough and clear my throat because something's stuck in my chest. One of the things I like to ask patients, part of the HPI, is can you point with one finger where you feel like things get stuck? And most patients are going to point right here, kind of right at the esophageal inlet, right at their sternal notch. And that is not as helpful because that could be a pharyngeal problem. It could be an esophageal problem given this localization. But those patients who point mid-chest, I want to see if they have esophageal spasm. And they'll, their symptoms sort of are different. They describe coughing and clearing their throat and chest pain after eating. And so those are the patients that, that I'll get a manometry for. And in terms of like medical therapy, can we go over some of the options? And then do you have an algorithm? Does everybody start with three months of reflux medicine or nasal steroid spray or something like that? And in terms of reflux medicine, is it a, usually a PPI or just an H2 blocker uh, suffice? It depends. Like I said, it depends on the crux of the chronic cough is a differential diagnosis, right? So it depends on what is wrong with somebody and kind of how I start. If, and I like to tell the patients this, that phlegmy feeling in your throat where you feel like something's down there and you feel like clearing or coughing can come from two places. Either something's coming up from below or something's coming down from above. So I do a fairly comprehensive sort of nasal sinus exam as well. On the way in with the flexible scope, I'm looking to see, do I see purulent drainage? Are their turbinates large? Do they have sticky allergic mucin? Do they have cobble stoning? You know, what does their nasopharynx look like? Do they have adenoids? You know, are they one of these adults that still have, that has a lot of adenoid tissue? I have, interestingly enough, treated several patients with chronic cough that actually have adenoiditis. It's this crusty, gross looking pus that's dripping down from their adenoids into their larynx and it makes them want to clear their throat. We see that in kids, but I don't know if you see that in adults. Every once in a while, we'll get a teenager. I'm like, well, dang, that's what's happening. Yeah, At least two or three times a season, I'll see some wow. in an adult. Yeah. So I start with kind of that nasal exam. And then we've done a comprehensive physical exam. And I think that they have reflux. Basically, they have erythema and edema of the intraritinoid band. They endorse burning chest pain. You know, they actually feel the reflux, things like that. I will treat them. I start with three months PPI once a day. If that is somewhat helpful, but doesn't completely take care of it, I do send them for pH testing. My next, the next change in my medication regimen is to make their PPI twice a day. I'm really sad that Dexalant is not covered by insurance anymore. As a fellow, we gave a lot of Dexalant out. I liked Dexalant because it was a 24 hour, like a lot release PPI. And then at night, if they had breakthrough symptoms, I would tell them, okay, before dinner, let's take a Zantac, like let's take a histamine blocker and dinner. So that I like that sort of approach to it as well. So BID PPI and add a Zantac at night. There's a lot of other interesting things out on the market. There's Reflux Gourmet, there's Gaviscon. It just kind of depends on what the chief symptoms are. And I wait till I get the pH probe. So basically, if once a day doesn't work, I get a pH probe and we look at when are you having more reflux? How bad is the reflux? And we try and manage it that way. And honestly, if we get to visit number three with me and I'm not getting good control of your reflux, I'm going to send you to GI. That's their wheelhouse. Yeah. You know, um, I'm not the expert on how to manage reflux. We have even met our threshold, I feel like, in Pete's, <laughs> you know, when it comes to, we used to, well, we still do, I mean, use reflux medications for laryngomalacia, depending on how symptomatic, but even that practice, it really depends on the pediatric otolaryngologist and, hey, I'm just going to go ahead and send you to GI because I don't want to manage the PPI or the H2 blocker or whatnot. 
And I think what we often forget, because there are people who've been on PPIs for many, many years, they're not benign medications. They have side effects too. They also need to be monitored. And like I said earlier, if somebody's been on a PPI for a year and no one has looked in their throat and their esophagus, that's an issue. Like someone needs to look in there. So I don't want to leave people on PPI forever and ever. That's why I think it's important that they be managed by GI as well. Yeah. And you mentioned, since we're still talking about pH and pH prep, a diary, do you have them write down when they're symptomatic too, to kind of see when their pH is up or low, excuse me, then they're symptomatic? Is that the... That goes with the pH probe. That's sort of part of that test. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then in terms of for the patients that haven't had a scope, and I know you do t e in the office, when do you have to consider going to the OR to do anything? And in the peds world, there's rigid bronchoscopy and triple scopes. And of course, it's kids. And so they're doing a soft, Lexisoft and a rigid DLB, direct laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy. Is there ever a time where you have, would you have to consider going to the OR for further diagnostic physical exam type evaluation? Or do you do flex bronchoscopy in the office at the same time on your initial evaluation? Yeah, I do flex bronchoscopy in the office. I think the nice thing about adults is you can pretty much do anything in the office. <laughs> um, all the diagnosis is in the office. <laughs> Which is great. So yeah, I will. I look in the airway. The blue plate special is the patient who comes in and gets a f- strobe and a fees, a bronch and a T and E. Got it. Okay. And I, I mean, I feel sorry for that, <laughs> but but, but it, it happens. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's part of it. People who, especially some of these post COVID patients, where they're short of breath, they're coughing. They also ca- say that they cough when they eat. They're getting the whole exam. They're getting, they're also getting a bronch because I need to see your subglottis as well. So yeah, absolutely. We do, we do a fair amount of bronchoscopy in the office. In terms of back to medications, do you ever, are steroids ever indicated? I very rarely give steroids. Yeah, I don't. And then what are your thoughts on like cough suppressants, some of the -the over-the-counter stuff or prescription? Right. So like I had mentioned kind of at the beginning, cough has a function too right? So we don't want to suppress it completely. I don't like the narcotic cough medicines. I also don't think they work very well. My go-to is Tessalon pearls. They're non-sedating. I think they work well, but it also masks the treatment that we're trying, right? So a lot of cough treatment is trial and error. Let's try a PPI and it doesn't work. Let's try treating your allergies and it doesn't work. So you're kind of going down this list of things But if you're also suppressing the cough at the same time, you can't tell what worked. So very rarely will I give somebody a cough suppressant. I do give people Tessalon pearls. But a lot of times what I'm doing is we're treating the underlying cause. So I'm sure we'll get to this. But like when we treat neurogenic cough, neurogenic cough gets treated in two ways. We do medication. There's a two-arm approach, essentially medication and therapy. So they're trying a medication a neuromodulator, but they're also doing cough suppression therapy at the same time. And if you don't do those two things together, you're not going to see good results. Is this a good segue to get into some of the neurogenic or are there other medications or things still in the differential? Yeah, that's that's the diagnosis of exclusion. I think we've covered, yeah, I think we've covered most of the other stuff. You know, there's also paradoxical vocal cord motion, which can present as coughing. It presents a shortness of breath that can be triggered by coughing as well. And that's something that's primarily treated. It's part of the irritable larynx picture. And it's primarily treated with therapy. Basically, it's almost like a muscle spasm that's happening in the larynx, in the throat. And so you want to teach people to break that muscle spasm. As I explain it to patients, which is a little oversimplified, when you get a muscle spasm in your calf, like you get a Charlie horse, you stand up and you stretch your legs. So when you get a muscle spasm in your throat and you feel like your vocal folds are closing, you want to try and stretch. You want to try and open your vocal folds. We give them exercises to do that. And then if that, if they're not getting the results they like, then we'll try an epitropium bromide inhaler. It's an anticholinergic bronchodilator. We know how it works in the lungs. We know how it works in the small muscles in the lungs. We don't necessarily know how it works in the larynx, but we know that it antagonizes the action of acetylcholine theoretically preventing muscle contraction. So in those patients that have exercise-induced cough or exercise-induced shortness of breath, we will have them do, I tell them, do a couple of puffs before you're going to exercise and then one puff every night. And so that's part of that irritable larynx picture. And sort of the other portion of that is the neurogenic cough situation. And neurogenic cough is also described as laryngeal hypersensitivity, 
It's essentially a sensory neur- neuropathy. It's usually post-viral airway hyperresponsiveness that persists beyond the resolution of the URI. We think the bad actor here is the vagus. It's vagal nerves, vagal neuropathy. But it's a decrease in the cough threshold in response to irritating stimuli. So as I tell the patients, there are things that were in the air that you encountered, cold air, ice cream, whatever it is, that didn't make you cough before. But now after you've had this illness, after the vagus nerve is irritated, those things are triggering a cough. So that threshold has changed. It makes patients more susceptible to chemical, mechanical stimulation of the cough reflex. So like I said, this is a, there are two arms to this treatment. There's a medication arm and there's a cough suppression that's therapy arm. The medication arm, and this is sort of the order that I do things in. I think everybody's a little bit different. I like to start with gabapentin. I'll do 100 milligrams TID for three months. I like gabapentin because out of all the neuromodulators, it has the least side effects. A lot of people have already tried gabapentin sometimes. Gabapentin is also the sort of first line for diabetic neuropathy. And it's easy to get. It's easy for patients to pick it up from the pharmacy. The next thing that I'll try is Elevil or amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is one 10 milligram pill once a day. The reason, honestly, the reason it's second is because it's an antidepressant. And when patients go to the pharmacy and they pick up an antidepressant, they get sometimes they get upset. And so I try and save that one for second. I tell them, you know, we've done one before. I don't think you're depressed, but this is another way that we use this medication in a very low dose. And then my third line is pregabalin or Lyrica. The reason it's third line is because it's difficult to prescribe. It's hard. Some insurances don't cover it. And it has some more side effects. It makes more people sleepy. I don't really like to give it to elderly people. Yeah. So this medication arm, is this just specific to the neurogenic cough? Or can you use some of these same medications for the irritable larynx picture? Or is that just speech path? Because I realize one is more of the muscle spasm and the other one is neurogen, like from the vagus nerve. So this is for the neurogenic cough. Okay. Yeah. So we're not doing this for the irritable larynx. No. That's speech path. Right. Right. Okay. All right. And then if the oral medications don't work, then that's when we start talking about superior laryngeal nerve block. And then the last thing that I will try is Botox. Okay. In terms of just one question about the gabapentin, I have this memory of having to ramp it up or something. Is there, do you have to do that for gabapentin or no? I I could be completely wrong. You don't have to increase gradually because I started a pretty low dose. 100 TID is pretty low. To give you perspective, diabetic patients are sometimes taking 900 three times a day. So this is a really low dose. I don't like people to stop it all of a sudden though. When they say, oh, my cough is a lot better. I'm not coughing. And I say, If it's three times a day, I'm going to have you take out the noon one first for a month. The next month, we're going to take away the morning one. Then the last month, we're going to take away. When we take away the third one in the day, I'm going to have you take it every other day for a month. So it's a long taper. And if your cough starts coming back, you go back up on the medication. Okay. And how long are patients on this for? It's basically like a three-month trial, but it takes it takes a year. It's a year of medication to try and, you know, to try and get rid of the cough because the taper is so long too. So it's, it can be six months to a year. And then do you find that, let's say it worked, but then my cough came back like a year after being off of it, that sometimes patients have to get back on it? They have to try it again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that can happen. What happens is you get another viral infection. Yeah. You know, and next time you have a viral infection, the same thing happens. It's kind of like, We see lots of infections that impact nerves and it doesn't always, you know, you have to be in the practice for a while before it kind of jogs your memory. But like if somebody's had a Bell's palsy after a viral infection once, it's more likely they're going to have it again. So this is true for neurogenic cough. If you've had a neurogenic cough once, the next time you get sick or maybe the time after that, you might have it again. Tell me a little bit about the superior laryngeal nerve block. Is this for the patients that we said that don't respond to the medications or maybe you have a patient where they just want to get off of the medication as well? If they don't respond to medication, they're not tolerating the medication, they've done the therapy also. So then we try the superior laryngeal nerve block. There are a couple of different ways to do it. How I do it, it's one cc, half of it is Kenalog 40 and the other half is lidocaine. The lidocaine is a short acting part. So that should give you some relief that day, the next day, that's the, um, the Kenalog, the steroid is a long acting part and its goal, its job is to decrease the inflammation of the nerve, the outer layer of the nerve. So the superior laryngeal nerve injection is 
it's a percutaneous injection and it's the landmarks are pretty easy to find. If you just hold the front of your neck, you feel the sides of the hyoid and you feel the corneal on the thyroid cartilage and you kind of, you go between them essentially. The original paper I think was Blake Simpson and he describes, he's got some great diagrams and he describes exactly how to do it. Now, different people do a different sort of modification of what they're injecting and how much. Mine is a one cc injection, a half lidocaine and half steroid. If that is not effective, then I will, after I do that three, they're one month apart. After with the third one, if you're still not getting benefit, then we will go to only steroid, no lidocaine, but one cc of steroid. I do a bilateral injection. And the reason I do a bilateral injection is I'm not giving them enough lidocaine to completely eradicate the patient. I'm not going to make people aspirate. But some laryngologists who are giving a different formulation are only injecting one side at a time. And it kind of, it just depends on how you trained. And, and I think they're equally as effective. I don't know that anybody's even compared them. There's a great study coming out of MUSC about the effectiveness of the superior laryngeal nerve block in general, because we just, it's something that's relatively new. People haven't been doing it that long. So it's a series of injections. Usually I tell people three to five, one month apart. And usually around month two or three, we start to see some improvement. And what we see is that each individual coughing fit is not as violent and as disruptive. And then the fits are fewer in nature. And so in terms of that's how you kind of counsel patients on outcomes, like this is what we should expect to see. Right. In terms of how long, I know some of the studies are coming out and it's new. What do you, in your experience, in terms of how long it lasts for, is that sort of patient dependent or is that, do you have like a time frame that you kind of go by? Like if I can do these injections over three to five months and I can give them a good year or two, is that kind of what we're looking at? Or this is a six to nine month thing and then we're going to be doing the series again? A lot of people get better forever. Their cough goes away. What I try to do is we do, when people start seeing some benefit, then I space their injections out further. So instead of doing every month, if you're starting to see some benefit, I say, let's go to six weeks. And the next time we're going to do two months. And when we get to the point where we can go two months without an injection, they're usually better by then. And they can, they call you if they start coughing again. And this may be a very novice question. Do you have a scope or anything in their nose uh, while you're doing the injection? There's nothing to look at, is there? No, there's nothing to look at because it's a relatively superficial injection. Okay. You can feel your hyoid. If you can feel your hyoid, you just put the needle down right right there. It's, yeah, no, there's, there's nothing to look at. There's nothing to look at. Um, what gauge needle do you use? I use a 27 gauge needle. Okay. And then uh, what percent lidocaine? 1%. 1%. Okay. All right. With no epi, just plain lighting. Just plain lighting. Yep. Okay. And then tell me, when do you consider Botox and how does that, how do you explain patients what you're doing with Botox? Botox is for like the very refractory patient. I think I've done this maybe a handful of times ever, but Botox, basically, I'm going to Botox your vocal folds so that they're open and you can't cough. And we do this for, the way I explain it to patients is coughing is like scratching an itch. The more you cough, the more you want to cough. And so we're basically just trying to reset the system. This is also good for patients who've developed a granuloma because it's kind of a chicken or an egg, right? Are you coughing because you have the granuloma or do you have the granuloma because you're coughing? So I'm going to just paralyze your voice box so that the granuloma can heal so that we reset the system. And it is it is honestly kind of because you can also cause them some dysphagia. If you can't close your vocal folds, you can cause somebody to aspirate. So oftentimes they'll have to thicken their liquids for a short period of time, for a month or so. Because the Botox is bilateral. Uh, usually it's on one side. On one side. Okay. Well, Botox one side, but it's like five units to one side so that they can't close effectively. They can't slam their pores shut to cough. Um, and you're basically just trying to reset the system. For those patients, do they ever have to do speech paths to help them sort of learn the exercises to relearn their swallow? Yes. Everybody does speech pathology appointments. They All these cough patients, they do. There's a respiration pattern for cough treatment, and then there's relaxed throat breathing. So all the cough patients do that. The patients that we Botox for cough, they will, oftentimes we will have them thicken their liquids for a month um, and we have them meet with speech pathology as well for that. So as we wrap up, Karuna, any other final pearls or tips for the patient with chronic cough or for giving in-office injections? I think the biggest thing about chronic cough that we don't necessarily realize or don't always appreciate is that chronic cough is a multidisciplinary problem. It can impact, like I said at the beginning, it can impact any any of the six major body systems, essentially, right? So we can't treat it in a vacuum. It requires interacting with 
our colleagues in pulmonary, our colleagues in GI, our, and speech pathology, of course. So it's it's a difficult problem and it impacts a lot of people it, and it impacts quality of life significantly. And so I think it's worth, you know, spending some significant time with those patients and working with our colleagues to try and find them some answers and some relief. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Karina. I learned a ton um, on adult chronic cough. These are hard patients. And it, like you said, it's it's miserable because uh, it affects so many aspects of their lives. And I thought the pre and post COVID, just seeing post COVID, it's also been very, very interesting to hear in terms of how it affects the airway as well. For our listeners, if they wanted to find out more about you or get in touch with you, are you on any social media? Um, I'm on Twitter uh, and I'm on Instagram. I don't really use them professionally, but it's awesome. I'm, I'm really easy to find and I'm uh, really easy through the LSU um, website. It's just uh, karuna.dewan at lsuhs.edu. Awesome. And this is LSU Entry Report uh, with, <laughs> with Dr. Sherry and Nathan, um, the giant. All right. Well, I think it's a wrap. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross and Ness smith Savadoff, Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Ogrodzinski. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.